Hi, my name is Mark Waterios, and this is my very first YouTube video. I'm not very tech savvy, I'm shooting this from my iPhone, and uh, I don't know how to video edit, so I hope everything turns out okay. And uh, so let's go. This is a reply to a series of videos by Dr. Wildberger, who is a professor uh, at the University of New South Wales. He makes the case that the square root, or that irrational numbers do not exist. He will say something like, if you look at the square root of 2, which equals 1.414, and so on, we look at that and he'll go, what do the, the dot dot dots mean? 1.414 dot dot dot. Well, we don't exactly know. They go on forever. So he'll say, as a, re, you know, as a result of that, if we don't exactly know them, then they don't exist. And he'll say the square root of 2, being an irrational number, does not exist. And he says that this is true of all irrational numbers. He'll even plot an exponential function, and he'll say, well, what's the square root of 1? It's 1. Okay, I'll put a dot there. I'll say, well, 2 is the square root of 4. Put a dot there. 3 is the square root of 9. Put a dot there. When it comes to the square root of 2, he puts a circle. Because he says the square root of 2 does not exist. I would like to make the case that it does and that it's important for us to recognize that it does. And the reason is, is because the purpose of mathematics is to describe the relationships of things that do exist. And simply because we can't define it things that exist in terms of a unit doesn't make them non-existent. It just means that they're not definable in terms of a unit. So what do we do then? Do we, do we throw away any reasonable effort to define them? No. We come up with a new system that is valid, that, is, that as closely defines them as we can. So what do I mean? I'll go back to the example that Dr. Waldberger likes to use himself regarding the Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. If I look at a triangle, and I say that it's kind of a lousy triangle, we'll go better. If I have a triangle besides a, b, c, and uh, the Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And what I have here is I have a side of a unit 1. Does it exist? Sure it exists. I have another side, also of unit 1. Does it exist? Sure it exists. This side is perpendicular to, the, to uh, this side here. Can I do that? Sure I can. Can I connect the endpoints of these two lines? Sure. So what's the length of this line? More importantly, will the length of that line, is it ever possible to define that line in terms of a unit? That's the real question. The answer is no. Why? The Greeks solved it long ago, and, and you can see this very proof in, in uh, Dr. Wildberger's videos if you get, if you get through them. But um, we start off with a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and we notice that a is 1 and b is 1, so a and b are equal to each other. So we can actually rewrite that as a squared plus a squared equals c squared. Then we combine these two a's, we have 2a squared equals c squared. And something very interesting here, if a is odd, square an odd number, you get an odd number. Multiply any odd number by 2, you get an even number. So that makes this side equal to, to an even number. If a is even, square an even number, you get an even number. Multiply an even number by 2, you still get an even number. So no matter what, this side is even. What's that mean? It means that c must be even. Why? Because if c were odd, square an odd number, you get an odd number. So this side can't be equal to an odd number, because this side is equal to an even number no matter what. 
So C must be even. Now the important thing is that all these terms are irreducible. They're in their lowest configuration possible. What do I mean by irreducible? Meaning that the ratio of these terms, they can't be reduced to anything more basic. Uh, Two-fourths is reducible. Why? We can pull a two out, make it one half. One half is irreducible. Why? There's nothing we can pull out. We can't make it smaller. There's no smaller equivalent value. So the important thing is to know is that this is irreducible, these terms. And since it's irreducible, that means that A must be odd. So C is even, A is odd. And then the Greeks did something interesting. They said, let's make C equal to something like 2 delta. Well, then C squared, 2 squared is 4, delta squared, delta squared. So what we have here is 2A squared equals 4 delta squared. I can pull the 2 out, make it A squared equal to 2 delta squared. So what you have to notice here is that this right here is the exact opposite of this right here. Which means that if in this case A was odd, in this case A must be even. But that's impossible because we just said A was odd. And simply replacing C with 2 delta shouldn't change that case. And so that's how the Greeks solved it, how they, how they proved it. So what's it mean? What does this mean? All it means is that no matter how big this side is, this can, these can mean a mile apiece. This side will not be definable in terms of the units that define these sides here. No matter how big these sides are, or how small they are, ad infinitum. So the question is then, does this side exist? Sure it does. It's one unit, horizontal. Can I get another unit going up at perpendicular to the first one? Sure I can. Can I connect these two points? Yes. Does this line that connects these two points exist? Yes, it does. Wait a minute, though. How do we express the length of that line in terms of these two? We can't in terms of whole units. We just prove we can't. The best we can do is give a symbolic representation for the magnitude of this line that best represents it, knowing that it is literally physically impossible for this line to be represented in terms of the same units that these two lines are, which are one. And in any decimal system, it's all, all decimal systems are, are, are based on a unit, a base unit, a smallest base unit. If you start with 1, it's 1. You can divide that to 0.1 to 0.01 and tenths, hundreds, thousands, all the way down infinite, into the smallest unit. It doesn't matter what the smallest unit is. This could be the smallest unit. This can be the smallest unit. This will not be definable in those units. But it exists. Now, Dr. Wildberger's solution is that, that um, we put a hole there. Using a symbol like the square root of 2 is tantamount to saying we can't, we recognize we cannot define this line in terms of these units. And so we define it the best way we can with a symbol, knowing that if we want, that we can only approximate it in terms of these units. And we're not even trying to define it in terms of these units. We're using a symbol. So what is like that line? It's the square root of 2. What is the square root of 2 in terms of units? We don't know exactly. We can approximate it. We don't know. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, why is this important? It's important because if you look back in history, uh, we've been discussing this kind of, you know, dilemma for centuries. It goes all the way back to Parmenides and Heraclitus. You know, Parmenides would say that nothing changes. Change is an illusion. 
Heraclitus would come back and say everything changes. You can't step in the, the same river twice. And then people come after him, Greek scholars, Greek uh, philosophers come after him, like Anax, uh, Anaximen, Anax, Anaximen or somebody, say that everything's earth, fire, air, or water. And uh, that's what everything's made of. And you have a guy after that, Democritus, he said, no, you know, you guys are kind of right, you don't know if you're right. You know, Parmenides, you're right. Nothing changes there. Everything's made out of this undivisible, unchanging thing called an atom. Heraclitus, you're right. Everything does change because these atoms are all different. There's smooth atoms, there's rough atoms, there's soul atoms. And they combine differently. And that's how we get all the different stuff. And then we come all the way into this, and then today, we define things in terms of discrete units. We call them particles, you know, atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons, particles. We get this particle idea. And what do we do? We then define some, we, do, we make a mistake. We define a line in terms of a discrete unit. We say, you know what a line is? It's a bunch of points. It's an infinite number of points. That's not true. And that's where the problem lies. That's really where the problem lies. It doesn't lie with this concept of irrational numbers. This is where the problem begins. Why? Because I don't care how many points you have, how many discrete units you have, I'll give you an infinite number. You put them all together, you will never have a continuous object. A continuous object can never be made up of discrete units. But here's the thing. The opposite is not true. You can create discrete items from continuous objects. If I have a line, or a, a wave, anywhere the two continuous objects intersect, guess what? There's your discrete object. That's a point. So you can create points from continuous objects, but you cannot create continuous objects from points. Never happened. And so the important thing is, is to deny things like irrational numbers, is, is to deny the continuum. Why? Because the reason that this is not definable in terms of a unit is because it's continuous. The reason this diagonal is not definable is because it's continuous. If it were not continuous, if it were discrete points, then you would be able to define it in discrete terms. But you can't. That's proof that lines are continuous. That there are going to be magnitudes on this line that are not definable in terms of a unit. The relationship of a diameter to a circle, not definable in terms of a, a unit. This right here, not definable in terms of a unit. Why? Because they're continuous objects. That's why. If you could define everything in terms of a unit, then you could almost make the case that the continuous does not exist. But if you cannot define something in terms of a unit, then you've got proof that the continuous does. And it's very important to understand that you can create the discrete from the continuous, but you cannot create the continuous from the discrete. And so this plays out when you listen to guys like, uh, at least for, in my opinion, uh, Dr. Susskind, Leonard Susskind of uh, Stanford. If I understand him correctly, when it comes to elementary particles, he actually defines them, you know, if you ask him, uh, what, is, what is the genesis, where is the genesis of an elementary particle? He'll tell you it's from a field. And he actually re they actually reach a point where they're defining particles in terms of fields. Fields are continuous entities. A particle is actually a three-dimensional wave for those guys. And a wave is a continuous entity. So what we have are continuous entities giving rise to discrete entities. And at that level, you've got them popping in and out of existence and all these other things happening. But they're coming from and going back into a continuum. And it just stands to reason. If you think of the fact that continuums can give rise to discrete, discrete entities, but not the reverse. So you, you're in danger when you deny things like irrational numbers because the reason a number is irrational is only because it cannot be defined in terms of a discrete unit. And you're in danger if you deny the existence of entities that cannot be 
uh, defined in terms of discrete units. You're in danger of denying a continuum. And I think that that would be a huge mistake. Um, I hope everything went well. That's, that's what I had on my heart. So, um, anybody watching this, thanks for watching, and uh, I appreciate your comments. Thanks.